What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Now available third edition everywhere, however you like the book, audiobook, hardcover, ebook, they're all available. They're out now. I read the audiobook, so if you can stand my voice for 20 hours, you can pick up the audiobook. All right, today uh, we, I don't have a guest. Um, this is another uh, Q&A episode, but if you didn't ask a question, don't turn it off just yet. You're gonna learn a ton from this. I'm gonna dive deep into publishing, administration, how that works, registration and royalties, but then we're also gonna talk about sync licensing. We're gonna talk about um, streaming services and I'm just scanning the things, team members, uh, release strategy, all of that stuff. Um, yeah, email, strategy, that kind of stuff. All right, so, uh, but as always, find us on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, at Ari's Take. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter, at Ari Herstand. Visit Ari's Take.com, get on the email list. That is where you're gonna get the most up-to-date information. That's where we put send out requests for questions. We'll do these, uh, do these kind of podcast Q&A episodes, but also I do uh, AMAs occasionally over email. I just did one over email. And, um, you know, I try to get back to as many people as we can. We got so many questions that came in through the, the podcast request. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to get through as many of these as we can. But don't worry. We're going to have many more interview episodes on the podcast coming up very soon. So uh, if you want this in your feed, hit the subscribe button, the follow Pause the episode right now and leave us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Those really help. And if you're listening on YouTube, hit that thumbs up, subscribe, all the stuff. All right, let's kick into the show. First question comes to us from Paul Twyford. He's a composer and self-publisher uh, from Woodstock, New York. Paul asks... I've registered my music with CD Baby and with SoCan in Canada. I've given CD Baby the authorization to track all plays. I am primarily making music uh, YouTube videos and every else CD Baby has distributed my music for streaming. Who pays me, CD Baby or SoCan? It's very confusing. Yes, Paul, it is very confusing. So let's break down publishing and who pays you and how you get your money. And actually, guess what, Paul? You are alongside Anita Eccleston, also from Canada, who asked a very similar question. So I'm going to read her question as well, and then I'm going to answer both of them at the same time. Anita asks, all right, a uh, complex question that has been confusing me the last year. No clear answer out there anywhere online. Well, here we go. I'm going to give you a clear answer. Very clear. I'm a Canadian songwriter and register my songs through SoCan, which in turn registers them with ASCAP in the U.S., I registered an old album with CD Baby's Pro Publishing Services to try to collect my oh, any outstanding publishing royalties from the worldwide territories using their affiliation with Song Trust. What happened next was confusing. Firstly, it is doubtful that this particular album has much missing royalties as it was not a great commercial success. However, the confusing thing is that in my SoCan catalog, the songs appeared as duplicates with the credits being 50% Song Trust and 50% me. It's been a few months and SoCan has still uh, still have those new entries listed as U and V, unverified. My understanding, what I've gleaned is that in order to collect my worldwide publishing royalties, Song Trust needs to register my songs in a standard publishing deal, but will be remitting me 85% of total collected. Does this seem right, May? Okay, let's break all of this down. So. Um, great questions, Paul and Anita. You're both in a similar boat with uh, CD Baby's uh, publishing service, SoCan as your PRO. Uh, for everybody else, let me just break this down. So SoCan is the performing rights organization in Canada. If you're in the States, you know we have ASCAP and BMI and CSAC and a couple others uh, a little bit, that are a little bit smaller. Um, the only PRO, performing rights organization, um, in Canada is, well, the main one is SoCan. And let's talk about CD Baby's Pro Publishing Services. Now, there are some distributors out there that also handle uh, admin publishing. CD Baby is one of them. TuneCore also has a publishing service. 
couple other ones out there. Uh, I know one RPM just want, launched one publishing recently. So some of them are starting to handle both sides and I should say both copyrights to a recording. As I hope you know and remember by this point, and if you've read my book, you'll know this like the back of your hand. There are two copyrights on every recording. There is a copyright for the master, that's the actual recording, and then there's a copyright for the song, the composition. Um, that is the publishing side of it. So, you know, there's all these rights within the, um, on the, the master side, and there's all these rights on the publishing side. This There's two completely different sides for one track, because, you know, sometimes you have songwriters that write a song that maybe, you know, they don't record the song, and so some people own the master, a label might own the master. An artist might own the master, but if they didn't write the song, they don't own the composition. They don't have publishing on it. Someone else wrote the song. But maybe if you did both, and most of us have done all of it, you know, where we wrote the song, we recorded it, we distributed it, so we're like, ah, I own everything. How do I get all my money? Yeah. So it is very confusing. Don't get me wrong. All right. So let me break this down. Uh, like I said, CD Baby has CD Baby distribution. You can just select that. Um, you can also opt in for their pro publishing service, which then they'll collect the um, publishing uh, for the song if you wrote the song. So you can only opt in a song, obviously, if you wrote it to their publishing service because publishing equals songwriting. Um, so CD Baby kind of makes this convenient for you. And, and yes, as you mentioned, Anita, Song Trust powers it behind the scenes. Uh, powers the CD Baby stuff behind the scenes. So when you log into your uh, PRO backend, whether that's SoCan or if you're in the States, that's ASCAP or whatever, you'll probably see Song Trust there um, listed. So uh, let's break this down. So, so Paul's first question is uh, about YouTube and um, who's going to pay you. So let's just let's just talk about um, how publishing and admin publishing works, especially with um, PROs, performing rights organizations. This is the publishing side. So um, if you have an admin publisher, they are going to uh, collect all of your publishing royalties from all over the world, every organization around the world. There's like 80 or 100 different organizations that collect, you know, performance royalties and mechanical royalties. These are your two, you know, publishing royalties out there. Um, SoCan in Canada really just collects the performance royalties. And uh, there's other organizations that collect mechanicals. Um, and in the States, you know, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, they collect performance royalties. There's also the mechanical royalties. All right, let's zoom out a little bit. Your publishing company is going to collect all these and they are going to keep a commission, um, with song trust or CD baby pro publishing. Uh, they're going to keep 15% and then send you the rest. So, um, now, the performing rights organizations like ASCAP, BMI, or SOCAN, how they work is they're just collecting the performance royalties, which is just one kind of publishing royalty. They're not collecting mechanicals. They're collecting performance royalties, which are generated from streams, but they're also generated if you get your songs placed on TV shows or they're played on the radio or any public performance of your song, including if you perform your song live in a concert. That generates performance royalties, and that's what's going to be collected by performance rights organizations, PROs, okay? ASCAP, BMI, SOCAN, all of that stuff. So um, let's see. You're asking. Okay. So yes, performance royalties are generated. ASCAP, BMI, SOCAN, what they do is they pay half of that money that comes in directly to the songwriter. Regardless if you have a publishing company or not, they are like, you know what? We don't trust the publishers out there to really pay their songwriters, so we're going to pay them directly. So they take 50% of the money and send it directly to the songwriter, whether you have a publishing agreement or not. And then they take 50% of the money and send it to your publisher. Now, if you don't have a publisher, some of them will send it directly to the songwriter or some of them will just not send it anywhere and you lose out on half your money. So it's always good to have a, a publisher, admin publisher, or sometimes just you know, you can register what's called a vanity publishing company with the PRO. But I like working with admin publishers because I know that I'm buttoned up and all my publishing money is going to be collected from all over the world. So um, 
So to answer your question, Paul, who's going to pay you, CD Baby or SoCan? Um, they're both going to pay you. SoCan is going to pay you as the songwriter, and they're going to um, send you 50% of your money directly as the songwriter. And CD Baby is also going to pay you uh, on one side as the distributor, so all the streams, you know, the money from the, the master royalties, but also because you've opted into their publishing services, they're also going to pay you as the um, as the publisher. And so SoCan's going to send them checks. CD Baby's going to keep their, you know, CD Baby and Songtrust are going to keep their 15%. They're going to send you the rest. Um, but also all the other organizations around the world, like the MLC and like, you know, ASCAP, like all the worldwide organizations, they're going to send, um, they're going to send the money to CD Baby slash Songtrust, really. Uh, they're going to keep the commission and they're going to pay you. So you are going to be getting checks from both organizations. Um, and YouTube, yes, pays, uh, theoretically should be paying performance royalties. And if you have um, monetization enabled on your YouTube channel, then um, YouTube will pay you directly if you have that monetization enabled. And um, But also, the... Uh, the songs that they distribute directly to YouTube, just like they distribute to Spotify and everywhere else, that's going to generate some royalties that the service is going to pay your distributor, CD Baby, they're going to pay you. All right, Anita, getting to your question, more specifically, um, okay, in the back end. So here's the thing. Um, if you've already registered your songs with a PRO, so you say it's so can. Um, you know, this, this is a common issue because, and then you go and sign up for an admin publisher. This is how it works most of the time for most people. Cause they're like, oh, you know, I know I need to sign up for a PRO. So I'm going to go to a PRO and sign up and register my songs. And like, I'm done. Right. And then you learn more. You read my book or listen to the podcast, or you talk to someone who knows something about publishing. And they're like, oh, you know, that, you know, that your PRO, only collects performance royalties, right? And you're like, what are you talking about? I signed up for publishing. My PRO, it's ASCAP, I'm done, right? Or it's SOCAN, I'm done, right? No, you're not done. You need mechanical royalties. It's like, well, what the hell, are, how do I get mechanical royalties? It's like, well, you need a publishing company or an admin publishing company. So then you go sign up for an admin publishing company, like, ah, shoot. Now, how do we connect the two? Because the publishing company is gonna be like, who's your PRO? You need a PRO. Because remember, your PRO is going to pay you half the money and then pay your publishing half the money. So then you're trying to sync this stuff up. Now, if you don't put in the right metadata, metadata just means like, you know, your correct IPI number, your ISWC number, and these, and these can be found in your PRO backend. So just log in to your SOCAN backend or your ASCAP backend or your BMI backend or whatever it is. Look up the numbers. What's your ISWC per song? And what's your IPI number? That's, that's your writer number. When they ask you for this information, whether it's in SongTrust or TuneCore Publishing or CD Baby Publishing backend, make sure you put that in there. They won't require it necessarily because uh, sometimes you didn't register the songs in a PRO and then it's fresh. But if you don't put that info in there, those numbers in there, yes, they're gonna put duplicates out there because um, you know, you're gonna register it with your PRO and they're gonna register that everywhere. Um, or in the PRO system, so SoCan's gonna have it. And then if you also register it with CD Baby Publishing or SongTrust, uh, they're gonna send it to SoCan and be like, hey, I have this brand new uh, copyright, this brand new song composition from this this songwriter, and yeah, it just happens to be called the same thing, but for some reason they can't figure the shit out and it's gonna be duplicated because they need the metadata, they need the numbers, they need the ISWC, they need the IPI number. So if you don't have the right numbers, because there's a bunch of artists out there probably called John Smith or whatever, you know? There's a bunch of artists by the same, songwriters by the same name. There's a bunch of songs out there called I Love You. So like you need the numbers to, to sync that up. So if you don't put the numbers in there, they won't, they will be duplicated. And now your shit's all messed up and then you're gonna have to go to your publisher. So you're gonna have to go to CD Baby and be like, hey, sorry, this is duplicated, can you fix this please? And then you're gonna go through this process or go through SongTrust or whoever you're using. So um, now you, uh, so first off you have to fix that. Um, 
And your second part of the question is uh, much uh, song just needs to register my song. 50 50 song letters. Well, okay. This is, I, I, you're, you're misunderstanding this a little bit. Um, and this is why you're probably not finding this information out there. I, it's, it's very confusing. Um, so in the back end, when you log in to like your back end for SOCAN, yes, it's going to say, uh, song trust is collecting 50%, um, as your ad administrator, you should still be the owner. So you're going to collect that, that 50% and, uh, they're going to send that 50%. Um, well, I should say, SOCAN is going to send that 50%, the publisher cut to, uh, song trust slash CD baby. They're going to take their 15% and send it to you. You don't have a 50, 50 songwriter split in you, you said my songs in a standard publishing deal. That's not correct. So let me, let me correct the record for you here. Um, it's not a standard publishing deal like you're calling it, 50-50 songwriter split. This is what's so confusing out there, and I kind of wish that the PROs would change this, but, like, this is... Everyone thinks that, like, because the PROs are so popular, because you you hear, oh, you know, in ASCAP, in BMI, in SOCAN, half the money is the songwriter's money and half the money is the publisher's money. Sure, but remember, that's only performance royalties. Don't forget about the mechanical royalties. It doesn't work that way for mechanicals. So like publishing, when you use the word publishing, that is just like the umbrella term and that is all publishing royalties. Yes, that includes performance royalties, but it also includes mechanical royalties. And remember, ASCAP, BMI, SOCAN, they don't touch mechanical royalties those are collected by totally different organizations way over here. They sometimes don't even talk to each other. And so like, yeah, they're different. So there is no standard 50-50 uh, publishing deal. That's that's just not correct. Um, Song Trust and CD Baby and TuneCore Publishing, uh, they keep 15%. So all the money that they're going to collect for you, they keep 15%. They send you 85%. But remember, the PROs are also going to send you as a songwriter directly half the money that they collect as that songwriter's cut. I hope this was clear. It is very confusing. This is a great time to remind you that you know you should jump into the Ari's Take Academy course, Registration, Royalties, and Release. We go through this very in depth. I have guides, I have sheets, split sheets. I literally share my screen and step you through how to register all your songs everywhere. Make sure that you're getting all of this done properly. Yes, it is very confusing. Um, but we also have a private community group where you can ask questions and I answer them in real time. Uh, so you don't have to wait and hope that I'm going to answer your question on the podcast. Um, I'm answering everyone's questions uh, very quickly. All right. Thank you, Paul and Anita, for those very uh, great questions. And yes, they're very confusing, but hopefully this cleared it up a little bit. All right. Next question comes from Cassidy Dickens, uh, Americana singer songwriter from Nashville. All right. Cassidy asks, um, what the heck is the waterfall release strategy and how does it work? I'm releasing a batch of new music this year. Would love to implement this, but I don't really understand it. Thanks in advance. No worries. Um, check out the recent episode. It was the, uh, live episode from South by Southwest that I gave this year. Uh, it was a speech that I gave at South by on how to release an album in 2023. Uh, I would actually encourage you to watch this on YouTube because I have slides and I, I go through this pretty in depth of, of how to do the waterfall release strategy. Also in the registration royalties and release course, I hold your hand as we step you through how to do a waterfall release strategy. And also in the book, if you have the book, um, I in my release rollout plan, I talk about how to do waterfall release. But let me break it down real quick what that means here. Um, the, the point of a waterfall release strategy, well, really what it is, is that you start releasing singles in advance of the album. Um, and the reason you do that is for the, uh, algorithm, like the Spotify algorithm, they like regular released music. So instead of just dropping the album on release day, you want to preface that with a few singles, four or five singles or something, and then you release the album. Now, what people have been doing and what is waterfalling mean is when you release a single, single number one is one song. Single number two is two songs. And what are the two songs on the single number two's release? 
Well, it's release number one and release number two. And then release number three has three songs. It's single number one, single number two, and now this new one, single number three. And the reason you do that is because when you point people to go listen to the new release, if you only have one song that you're sending people to, they're gonna listen to one song and then Spotify is gonna autoplay other people's music. Well, if you want them to keep listening to your music, that's why people waterfall. That's why people put like three songs in one release, four songs in one release, five songs in one release, and like, yeah, you could technically call, oh, it's an EP, but not really. So artists are really like leading up to an album, they'll do like, release one number one, release number two has two songs, release number three has three songs, release number four has four songs. And they kind of include it there. Now, um, some people do different single covers for each of these releases. Some people just use the album cover. Um, and then some people uh, sometimes take down the initial singles and just leave the album up once the album is dropped. But here's an update. If you did watch that speech um, or you followed the steps, be very, very careful when you take down releases because you do not want to take down this, the releases from TikTok. So I would carve out TikTok because um, you can take down releases from Spotify and Apple Music and everywhere else, and they will sync up. The, the streams will maintain, the playlists will maintain as long as you use the same ISRC numbers. Um, however, if you take it down from TikTok, as of now, their system is not great and your song will get deleted from TikTok and you don't want that. So either use sound on uh, to distribute your song just to TikTok and then use your distributor to distribute it everywhere else. I uh, definitely do not recommend using sound on yet to distribute your song everywhere else because it's just, they're just not great at the distribution game yet, but they're great at, dis at getting your sound on TikTok. And then you can carve it out. You can say uh, to your distributor, uh, send my distributed song to every DSP in the world except TikTok. You can literally, you can literally just uncheck TikTok and uh, any any distributor will let you do that. So you can do that. Or if you just want to use, keep it simple, use one distributor, it's fine. They can send it to TikTok. But then when you take it down, uh, some distributors will let you carve out DSP platforms from where you can take it down from. Some won't. So you want to check that out. Uh, just be careful about that. Um, okay. So Cassidy, if you wanna learn more about the waterfall release strategy, this was just a quick overview here. Um, check out that, that previous episode of how to release an album in 2023 or in the book or in the registration royalties and release Ari's Take Academy course. And I do wanna remind you, um, depending on when you're listening to this, um, Ari's Take Academy, we only open enrollment twice a year. Uh, enrollment's actually closing in a few days. So if you would like to join us in the Academy um, this this spring summer, uh, you should head over to ariestakeacademy.com and you should enroll quickly because we're closing it soon. All right, next question comes to us from Amber from Shiny Shiny Black. Uh, that is the band. And then uh, Goshen, Indiana. Is that how you say it? Goshen, Indiana? Cool. All right, Amber's question is, hi, Ari. Uh, my question is about direct marketing for musicians. I saw you advise running ad campaigns as part of a release and loved learning about what your friend Lucidius has done with advertising growing his audience. Do you have a recommended structure for direct marketing or ad campaigns? I would tend to want to use ads to lead to email or text signups, but it sounded like Lucidius was sending paid traffic directly to Spotify streaming platforms. Where would you point your ads? Thanks. Um, yes, so... Uh, if you're not familiar with what Lucidius did, he's a hip hop artist, um, totally DIY independent. He now has over 300 million streams on uh, various streaming platforms. Uh, he's not on any official playlists. He's never really done the TikTok thing. He has over 300 million streams, uh, primarily from paid ads. Now, I enlisted him to teach the Ari's Take Academy course on streaming and Instagram growth course because of this. We now have over 1,700 students in that course that are using these methods very successfully. Um, yes, running ads on social media platforms, if you know how to do it, is one of the most effective marketing strategies still to this day next to TikTok. Now, of course, TikTok is free, um, but you're like playing the lottery. And honestly, TikTok right now, and we're talking in um, May of 2023, 
uh, is not really as effective as it once was. You know, people aren't really going having those big viral moments anymore. I mean, some of them, but really not what it was in, in 2020, definitely not, or 2021, and even 2022. So TikTok is not what it once was. Granted, it's free. You can play the lottery and you can post a bunch and, and hope for the best. And still, labels still like to see that. But if you have a little bit of a budget, I definitely encourage you to run ads but don't do this blind. I've wasted thousands of dollars uh, trying to run social media ads and not knowing how to do it and hitting those boost buttons and whatever. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, so we have a course teaching you how to do this if you wanna do it. You can also hire agencies out there. There's plenty of marketing agencies uh, if you have a big budget because most of them charge about $1,000 a month uh, just for their services and then you have to spend another $1,000, $1,500 a month on ads. Um, that's what most of these companies will charge. So if you have a good budget, $2,500 a month to spend, you can hire an agency to do this for you. If you don't have that big of a budget, um, you can enroll in our course and spend $5 a day on ads and we'll teach you how to how to do this directly. Um, but yes, I, I definitely recommend doing this. And then, you know, it's all about your objectives. So once you learn how to run ads, sure, you can change your objectives. You can send people, you know, retarget them and just get your fans and get them to sign up on your, your email list or something like that. Um, our methods is to increase streaming. So we really primarily focus on sending a bunch of uh, cold traffic to streaming platforms and then working on converting that into real lifelong fans. Um, so yeah, check it out. All right, Angelica um, launching her pop music project, Lady Amo, in the summer. And you're from Paris. All right, Angelica. Is that Lady um, Amo, Amoy? Um, um, is there an R missing, Amore? I don't know. Um, all right, Angelica. Should I run ads to my YouTube music page as soon as I launch or wait to grow a decent audience organically first through algorithmic, algorithmic means, YouTube search, TikTok, etc.? So... You definitely can run ads um, on YouTube, and it's not that hard to run YouTube ads. Uh, I haven't really seen it convert super well, but if you're like just you know looking for a little vanity metrics and you want to just like get a few thousand views on your latest music video, um, you definitely can run ads to your YouTube videos, and and it will get you more views. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily, um, yeah, I mean, it, it can definitely help the conversation. Honestly, it, it's, it's helpful to, you know, send people to the video and it looks, you know, it's got five, 10,000 views and that, that helps a little bit. Um, it's, it's just part of the, the story. It can help trigger the algorithm a little bit. Uh, you, it'll, you know, start recommending the video. You can kind of help get things started that way. If you run ads, um, to YouTube, um, organic growth is, is the best because it's free. So yes, uh, you should work your TikTok angle. Um, you know, all of these platforms like you posting more. So if you're focusing on YouTube, post YouTube shorts. You know, of course you can do TikTok and you can repurpose that for reels and shorts. All these platforms like you posting um, on the platform natively. They don't, don't make sure you do not have the TikTok logo on the videos that you're putting on Instagram Reels or YouTube Shorts. So, you know, edit it out off platform, upload it to the platform, maybe add a few little tweaks based on the platform's editing capabilities and stuff like that. All that stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, next question comes from uh, Gabriel Garcia from Georgia. Uh, DIY one-man operation artist and songwriter. All right. Gabriel, why does nobody talk about Pandora? <laughs> I know Spotify and TikTok dominate the market, but Pandora seems to look for the audience who are the most likely to listen to your music. I released my first single ever in December. Congratulations. A second single four weeks later and an album with the two singles in it four weeks after that. I started with zero monthly listeners. A week after releasing my album, I had a thousand listeners. With Spotify, where I have only six monthly listeners, you have to work long and hard to pay for ads to get people to listen to your music. So let's talk about Pandora. Um, if you're seeing success on Pandora, hell yeah, go to Pandora, go to AMP, 
That's AMP, amp.pandora.com. And that is their that is their Pandora for artists. It's, it's an amp. And there's a bunch of free tools you can use in Pandora, like running single campaigns. Uh, it's free. So you can promote your music within Pandora and check it out. Uh, the reason that people aren't really talking about Pandora as much is because they don't really have the market share that Spotify or TikTok do uh, or Apple Music um, or, frankly, many of the other ones. But, yes, um, I'll, there's still a lot of users of Pandora. Uh, most of these users are older um, and most of them are, quote, unquote, lean back listeners, meaning they're not really there to discover new music. Does it happen? Sure. Um, but it's just a different listening experience. And also because they don't show the numbers front and center, the conversation, there's not much as much conversation around it. Because Spotify shows all these numbers publicly, these are talking points. Um, so, you know, if Apple was showing their numbers publicly, people would be talking more about Apple Music. They do have over half, 50% of the listenership in the U.S., believe it or not. Um, Apple Music does. Uh, but we talk about Spotify a lot more because we can measure those metrics publicly. Um, but yes, if you're killing it on Pandora, hell yeah, go, you know, uh, focus on Pandora and um, run some some of those single campaigns. All right, next question comes from Dara Ackerman or Dara. Uh, Dara Ackerman, indie singer-songwriter from California. I just heard something from someone with a background in music business administration. He said that if you purchase a song on iTunes, that serves as a license for use in videos on social media. One dollars for unlimited use of a song. And I assume that the artist gets no royalties other than that. Is that right? Thanks for the opportunity to ask. No, that's not right. My God. I, I This is the thing that I cannot stand <laughs> about people who give advice if you don't know what you're talking about, don't talk. Just be humble and say, I'm sorry, I don't know that. Don't pretend like you know it. Uh, that is, uh, fuck, there's so much, sorry, uh, there's so much incorrect information out there. No, you can't just buy a song from iTunes and then, you know, go throw it on a fucking TV show. Are you kidding me? Or you're saying social media? No, no, that's not how the law works. That's not how rights work. That's not how licensing works. That's not, that's just, that's just not true. That's, that's just, yeah, that's not true. And um, I'm sorry that someone gave you incorrect information uh, like that. But no, how licensing for social media works is they've had to negotiate with the publishing companies. They represent the rights for the publishing, the, the actual compositions, the song. And then also negotiate licenses and work license out with the record labels and distributors for the master of uh, use of the song. Um, most of the social platforms have negotiated these licenses. They've negotiated blanket licenses. And, you know, if you haven't seen any of this money, that's because the system is rigged. <laughs> and the labels and the publishers walked away with all this money. And, uh, yeah, go ask your label. Go ask your publishers. Like, didn't you strike a deal with Facebook to license all of your all of our music, including my music, for like three hundred million dollars, like hundreds of millions of dollars? Where is that money, by the way? Can can I can I get some of that money? Well, that's that's a, it's a scam. Um, so uh, unfortunately, yeah. And if you're not part of a, a label or a publisher that um, that negotiated on your behalf, mind you, and didn't pay that money out to you because a lot of them didn't. Uh, some of them did. Some of them, like, you know, had that money trickle down and, and based on kind of the uh, market share within their catalog, they would they kind of added that to everybody's checks. A lot of people didn't. Um, you know, ask them, where's that money? Uh, but but no, no. The, the, there's, the, there's no rights that you can just, like, buy a song from somewhere and just, like, pretend like you now own the song and you can put it anywhere you want. That's that's not how licensing works. Okay. Yaniza, hey Yaniza, uh, Ari's Take Academy student from singer song from New York City. Uh, all right, Yaniza, at what point is it a good idea to have a lawyer on your team? I don't even know how insanely expensive they are, but is it crucial to have one at a certain point? Um, I, I don't know if you caught my last Q and A on the podcast. Uh, my, you could hear me ranting about attorneys on there for quite a while. Um, 
very, very, very few artists uh, can afford to have lawyers on their team. Now, if you're making a, a decent amount and you're negotiating a lot of deals like brand deals regularly and you know just a bunch of deal and collabs and producer deals and all that kind of stuff and you and you're having contracts needed to be negotiated frequently and you're making a ton of money some lawyers will work on five percent uh of your income now you know uh i don't know you make a million bucks this year you're gonna pay your lawyer fifty thousand dollars are they doing fifty thousand dollars of work i don't know uh, but most lawyers and how I've paid lawyers and how most artists pay lawyers is on uh, an hourly basis. I don't care for this business model. I think it's awful. I'm not going to go on the rant again. I already did the rant last episode. Um, but, you know, a lot of entertainment lawyers out there are charging $300, $400, $500 an hour. An hour. Can you afford that? Shit. I mean, so that's their business model. So uh, you can't really have one on your team. I usually engage lawyers uh, on a case-by-case basis. So if I need a contract uh, kind of written up for something, I'll ask a lawyer to do it. Um, I mean, personally, I've learned a lot about it. I can negotiate most of the contracts on my own. Um, any lawyer right now is cringing listening to me say that. Just like, no, you should always hire a lawyer. Of course, you're probably trying to protect your business business model. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's all a scam. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, you know, engage a lawyer when uh, you need a contract written or negotiated uh, or looked over, um, you know, or some uh, you can hire to shop you around. They have connections. They have relationships. Shop you around to, you know, potentially indie labels or publishers or something like that. Um, that's a way, you know, you're going to pay them either. Some of them will work if they really believe on you on that 5% based on like an advance you're going to get or something like that. Um, but most of them are just working hourly. And, you know, they love getting you on the phone because they can clock every minute. They they do it down to the minute. And so they, they get you on the phone and like, do you have any questions? I'm like, well, I don't know. No, no, come on, ask me your question. What do what are you what's your question? Oh wow, well, thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess you know I do have all these questions. Two hours later, you're like, wow, thank you so much for the time. And then the lawyer's like, no, thank you, because that was a six hundred dollar call. So just be very careful when a lawyer asks to get you on the phone. Be like, you know what? How about we do this over email? We don't need to get on the phone. They're like, no, no, no. I really think we should explain it. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, if you're on the clock, you know, we can get on a free call on the phone. Well, that's my business model, blah, blah, blah. All right. Final question comes from Kareen. Uh, Kareen did not write where she's from, but uh, says, hi, Ari. I need a resource for pricing norms for sync deals. Even a list of examples of good deals versus crummy deals would be very helpful. It will help me know my song's worth, and I'm honestly afraid of being played or coming off as arrogant price-wise. Thanks for all you do for us. All right. Well, Kareem, um, we have this resource um, it, in our Ari's Take Academy course, Advanced Sync Strategies. Uh, we step you through all the various deals. Um, you know, I can give you some ballpark. Uh, for TV shows, you can expect... Two, three, four thousand dollars for an upfront sync fee. I've seen upwards of ten thousand dollars for some shows. Um, I've seen as cheap as five hundred, but honestly, you should be looking at around two, three thousand um, dollars for movies. Um, sky's the limit. You know, you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars for that, if not more. For commercials, I've seen hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars for commercials. Um, you know, video games usually in the single digits or maybe 10,000, something like that. Um, so it, it's, it's good money. But again, if you're, if you're really interested in sync, uh, definitely recommend joining us in our sync course, Ari's Tech Academy. It's taught by Vo Williams. He is a, an artist that has over 1500 sync placements of just his music. He also has a sync agency. We have about a thousand students in that course. A lot of them um, have, they've said they've, they've already paid for the course four times over based on the syncs that they've been able to get from the strategy they learned in the course. And also in this course, we help get our students signed to sync agents and then they negotiate the deals for you and you don't even have to worry about it anymore because yes, you should definitely uh, try to work with a sync agent and uh, that's what we do. We we twice a year in our sync course, in this Ari's Tech Academy course, um, we have the agency submission process and we get our students signed and we've gotten 150 of our students signed to 
sync deals, sync agencies. All right, cool. Thank you so much. I uh, hope this was helpful and I will see you next time. Peace. Today's episode was edited by Maxton Hunter, theme music by Brassroots District, and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.